can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the homepage and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. That some Christians are poor and not rich. Well, two things. Ignorance of the truth and then choices. Some are ignorant and don't know the truth because the truth is, how could you be poor if you already have been made rich by God? If God is your father and he's the king and he's got everything and the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that be in it, everything belongs to him and you are his kid, you are not poor by any standard. But what you're going to enjoy in life will depend on what you know about this reality and how you apply it. But secondly, even those who know, some make choices. They choose to not live in wealth or affluence or have anything. Some just make that choice. And so, um, it depends on individuals, apart from ignorance. If, if you're ignorant, well, you, you suffer for it, you pay for it. God said, my people have destroyed the lack of knowledge. And then some others, even though they know, like I said, uh, choose to go without. And there's nothing wrong with that. programs here in the US and it is a tremendous blessing. Please I'd like to know what is the importance of an altar offering? Is there any special significance to placing your offering on the altar rather than in an offering collection bag? Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Well, um, you would need to know different churches have different ways. Some don't even use collection bags. They have a collection tray. Some use a collection box. So different churches have different uh, ways that they receive the offerings so you would need to find out in some in some uh, churches they will tell you that the offerings will be on the altar and the tithes will be in the bag now they have different ways it depends on church policy so find out from your pastor if they are the same in that church or if there's any difference are the offering bags an extension of the altar collections or do they represent anything else um, if i put my offering on the altar will that signify something different so it depends on the church now the platform that is often referred to as the altar uh, is designed in so many different ways so you have to remember altar doesn't necessarily mean platform so find out from the pastor or the leadership of the church, what they mean by the altar. 
some have a special offering altar which is not a platform from where the pastor preaches so it depends on the church you would need to ask specific questions uh, in that church Nigeria the financial global crisis in the world does it really or can it affect the believer or the one who's born again because a lot of Christians are complaining about the financial crisis well um, does can it affect the believer yes it can affect the believer because we live in the world see we are not of the world though we live in the world so the things that happen around us can affect us but then that's why we need to be in the Word of God that's why we need to function by the power of the Holy Spirit that's why we need to function through higher principles of life otherwise the things happening around us can affect us so in Job chapter 22 and verse 29 it says when men are cast down then thou shalt say there is lifting up and he shall save the humble person he shall deliver the island of the innocent and it is delivered by the pureness of thine hands so when men are cast down thou shalt say there's lifting up he tells you what you're going to say so we can be affected by happenings around us but that's why we need the word of God so we can function because we are in the world but not of the world Jesus was hungry he was affected by hunger and when there was no food he couldn't get anything but then he could operate through the Word of God see so you use God's Word that's why you've got to learn the Word of God and become a man or woman of faith Thank you so much for tirelessly feeding us with the Word of God. I am a tither and a consistent partner. I also believe in the law of seed time and harvest. Then she says, Pastor, for the best part of my 13-year marriage, I have depended on my husband financially, and this has affected my level of partnership. I've worked in a couple of places which were all short-lived and also tried my hands on some businesses which did not work out. Pastor, I know I am not a failure, but sir, what more do I need to do? Uh, did you get the question? She says she's, a, she's been a tither, she's, she's, uh, she believes in the law of seed time and harvest and um, for her 13 year marriage she's been dependent on her husband financially and now she wants to be able to you know stick out on her own and in, in, in financially and and be able to to do more and she says what what, what can i do um, thank you very much sir the um the issue is the the bible says that the just shall live by faith we are believers in christ and as believers in christ we were never supposed to depend on anything other than Christ. And the word of God tells us clearly, Paul said, Philippians chapter 4 verse 19, that he said, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ. He didn't say your husband, he didn't say your business. So even if a Christian does business or is married, or you have a father that's very wealthy, a friend or whatever, you were never supposed to look up to your husband or to your job or to your business as your source uh, because that is the problem she's facing now you depended on something else as your source now you're suddenly realizing because man's help is temporary it can fail so she needed to depend on the word of god and live by faith according to the word of god because christ is our source yeah, I think that's, that's very important. Look, I'll come back to that. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Um, well, your husband can be, um, God can bless you through your husband or through anybody. But looking at your question, uh, it's an issue of 
you wanting to do something and then be self-sufficient to do all that you need to do in the kingdom of God. And all it takes is for you to take a decision. Um, you tight, praise God, you tight. God's word doesn't fail. And um, you tight and God definitely will respond to you. But all you need now is to decide on what to do. If you want to do business, ideas will come to you, but you have to apply your mind to what you want to do and then you can do it. Yeah, but the, the, she says she's tried her hands on a couple of businesses and, and uh, she's gone to different places as well, but that these things failed. That's her real problem now. You see, you, 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 Reverend Tom mentioned something that's very important. I, I want to quickly look at that. He's trying to point out to you that your focus was wrong. Even though your husband um, was responsible for the finances that you were receiving, you didn't think of the fact that God was behind that supply. Now, in your subconscious, you, 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 you probably did, but you, you're trying to, okay, I, I don't want to depend on my husband anymore. I want to work. Now, you've got to have your focus right. You were not depending on your husband. If you were, then you were wrong. You should have been depending on the word. Now, if you're dependent on the word, the same faith with which you depended on the word and the supply came through your husband, that same faith would have created other avenues. See, because you remember when Elijah, when God was feeding Elijah uh, at the brook and uh, the bird was bringing food to Elijah, after a while, the brook dried up. You see, God said, now, I want you to go to Zarephath. Yes, sir. I have appointed someone there to feed you. Why did God dry it up? Because he was dependent on that. God doesn't want you to depend on anyone but him. Now, the supply can come through any channel, but learn to give glory to God. Your language matters. You may, you, you may respond and say, oh, no, 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 I, I, I knew it was God who was blessing us. I wasn't dependent on my husband. But your language betrays you. Remember, in the realm of the spirit, what you say is what you get. See, it matters. It says, by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So your words communicate the inner thoughts of your heart. He wants us to sow a seed and tells us that even if we do not have the money, we can or must sell something we have. Even when the Holy Spirit has not spoken to me, must I go ahead? <laughs> well, you got to understand something about pastoral guidance. That's very important. If the pastor gives you an instruction, it's supposed to be the Holy Spirit giving you an instruction because the, the, the pastor was made a pastor by the Holy Spirit. So... Um, uh, one of the ways that the Holy Spirit speaks to you is through your pastor. So you can't say if, if, the, if the Holy Spirit has not spoken to you. The, when the pastor spoke to you, the Holy Spirit spoke to you. See, you don't, you don't require uh, another voice to tell you that that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you. See, so you don't need to wait for another voice. You do what the pastor has told you. Now, that's not to say that um, we are naive not to realize that there are rogue pastors. See, that means um, those who are uh, deviants and, and who um, estrange themselves from the right way of God's word. It doesn't mean we're not aware that there are such things, but they also can be cured, corrected by the word of God. The Bible says, who art thou to accuse another man's servant? Um, to, to his master, he standeth or falleth, and yea, God is able to make him stand. So, um, that's up to the Lord. But the fact that you're in that church and you are still there, you, you, it means you believe that the pastor is a true pastor. So if he's giving you this instruction, I think it's an important instruction. You may not know why the Spirit of God is asking you to tell you to do such a thing at that time. So it's better to do it.
After all, he didn't say what exactly you must give or sell. It's still up to you. See? So you don't need to wait for another voice. Just do what he's told you to do. It will turn into your blessing. There's no giving in the house of God that, that will lead to your loss. The only people who ever give and lose are those who give in unbelief, in, in doubt, and um, uh, who are only merely testing the Spirit of God. You don't do that to God. So, when you find some people saying that they gave, they were members of a certain church and they gave until they were broke and they didn't get any blessing for it, it shows they were giving in unbelief. See, you don't give in unbelief, you give in faith. See, you give in faith and you trust God. And faith means that you believe that you have actually received the blessing for it. You can't, you can't say that you have received and come back to say, I didn't receive, if you truly received. After all, that's what faith is. Faith is calling real that which you are yet to see or perceive with your senses. Otherwise, it's not faith. Wonderful opportunity. I wish to know if students are supposed to give tithes. Please, could you explain why we students have to give tithes and how we should do it? The Bible um, didn't address your status as far as tithing is concerned. It didn't say whether you're a student or you're a worker. Because it doesn't say that you should give tithes out of your salary. It doesn't mention the word salary. It says of your increase. Of your increase, meaning your income. However, you have been blessed. So it depends on whether you actually got an income. What is an income? What is an increase? He uses the word increase. See, so your tithing comes from your increase, whatever the Lord has best you. And remember, tithing was not, we were not asked to tithe so that God can get something out of it. It's for our benefit. See, the, it's that partnership that you come into with the Lord. And that ensures your continual increase. See, constantly he multiplies that which you give to him. He never owes you. He never takes anything from you to keep you without. It's never a reduction. It's always an increase. So remember, tithing is more to your benefit than it is to anyone else. So, he didn't say that um, if you're a student, you're tithe or you're this or that. No. He just says, of all your increase, anyone who receives an increase should tithe. Because by tithing, you're recognizing and declaring and confessing that he was the one who actually blessed you. And you are you are declaring or reaffirming your partnership with him in everything. Because you see, he lives in a realm that's different from the realm in which we live in this earth. See, and so that partnership is important. That makes us work together. It's a koinonia, that's the Greek word. It means a partnering together, a fellowshipping together. And why should one who is a tither and a giver find himself in financial challenges such that it's sometimes difficult to obey the spiritual instruction to tithe, let alone meet his own basic needs? Anybody could face financial challenges. The, the challenges that come to you, whether financial or otherwise, don't really matter. Um, Life can be full of challenges. What's important is what you do with the challenges that you face. So this time, it's financial. Now, just because you tithe doesn't mean you shouldn't face financial challenges. And that's why your life of faith is very important. See, giving your tithe is one part of God's word that you have fulfilled. You ought to learn the word of God and how to live by faith, walk by faith, speak the words of faith. Again, even in your giving and tithing, you ought to speak God's word. You know, it's like sowing your seed and watering the seed. Watering the seed is speaking God's word upon your seed. So you don't just give. You give, but you speak God's word upon your giving. And that's where a lot of Christians um, have made some kind of mistakes because they think that giving is, a, is enough. No, when you give, 
you speak God's word on your giving. See, remember what the Bible says. God said in the last days apart my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. He said we will have the power of God's spirit to prophesy. Meaning to speak words of blessing and power. And that includes speaking words of blessing and power upon our seed. When we give. So remember that. Always speak God's word upon your giving. So when you give, it's like sending your seed. Like when God said, my word shall not return unto me void. He said, it shall prosper. See? So you also, when you give, you release your, the, the word of God in your lips, upon your seed and your tithes. And it will produce results. So that's very important. And remember to always live according to God's word. Your life of faith is important. So that no matter what challenges face you, you will always win. You will come out victoriously. So don't be surprised that you're facing financial difficulties. It's just part of life, but you must win. See? So you say, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. That's what matters. Remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Good works. What does the Bible say about partnership? Can the church or any Christian organization for that matter receive support from here anywhere, including non-believers or non-believing organizations? Thank you. Well, we should always be careful for, about wherever we get support and from whomever we get support. We should always know what kind of support they're giving us and for what reason they're giving us the support. That That is always important. But then, um, no matter who it is, whether it is a Christian or a non-Christian, if the, if the reason for doing it is right, if the purpose is right, if the motive is right, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong for, um, in receiving the support, even if that person is not yet a believer. Now, let me read something to you from the Bible. Remember, the motive matters. Even a Christian with a wrong motive, his offering is abominable. So the motive matters. Let me read something to you from the Bible. First, I'm going to read to you from um, St. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 7. Let's read from verse 2. that That'd be all right. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he said unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For, listen to verse 5, how they convinced Jesus to go. For he loved our nation, and he had built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. In other words, Jesus going with them was connected to what they said. Otherwise, he would have said, Jesus went with them. But it says, then Jesus went with them, connecting his going with what they said. That the man, this was a Roman centurion. They said, he loved our nation and has built us a synagogue. So he, who, who was the synagogue for? For God, for the worship of God, for the teaching of the scriptures, for the Jews. You see, it was a good work for God. But the man was a Roman. And therefore, was not in the covenant. And yet, Jesus was compelled to go because of that. Which means, Jesus accepted that good work. Well, let me show you something even more convincing. Acts chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house. He feared God with all his house. But listen. Which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the night hour of the day. An angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. 
And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. Wow. Was this man a Christian? By now, Christianity had started. It, it was possible to be born again by now. This is the book of Acts now. This is Acts chapter 10. The man was not born again. Listen. An angel came to him, even though he was not born again. And the angel said, your prayers and your arms are come up for a memorial before God. God's recognized what you've been doing. And then, verse 5. And this is very enlightening. Verse 5. And now, send men, the angel tells him, send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged with one Simon Etana whose house is by the seaside, he shall tell thee what thou orders to do. He says, the angel, the, the angel said, Peter would tell you what you should do. Now, the rest of the message, that the angel, the, 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 the detail of what the angel actually said, we can get further from uh, chapter 11, from verse... 13 you know when when peter went there he heard more perfectly from the man himself and then he recounted this uh to the disciples and apostles who were with him in chapter 11. now let's listen to what he said here from verse 13 talking about what cornelius said to him he says and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on all them as on us at the beginning. This is remarkable. Even though the man was praying and God heard his prayer, the angel said God heard his prayer. Even though the man was given arms, he still was not saved. That's to say, he hadn't received salvation. That's remarkable. Because here, the angel said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Peter. When he comes, he shall tell you words by which you and your house shall be saved. That means the man was not saved. Otherwise, the angel wouldn't say that. So, but God saw his arms and accepted it and said, your, your prayers and your arms have come up before God as a memorial. And an angel visited him. But it didn't save him. So even though a non-Christian may support the work of the gospel, it may not save him. It wouldn't save him. He would still need to hear the word of the gospel and have faith in Jesus Christ personally and receive that salvation. But his support for the gospel is a good work accepted by God. That's what the scriptures show us. United Kingdom. Dear Pastor Chris, I would like to know how to water my seeds and also how to ensure good results as I have the impression that I'm not doing it the right way. Thank you, Pastor. You're such a blessing to the nations. Thank you. I'd like to know how to water my seeds. Yes, the Bible does talk about sowing and reaping. It talks about seed time and harvest. So the idea behind this is right. Now as to how to water your seed, what I would like us to look at is what the Bible says in regard to that um, we'll begin with 1st Corinthians chapter 3 who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom he believed even as the Lord gave to every man I have planted Apollos watered but God gave the increase so neither is he that planted anything neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase now he that planted and he that watereth are one, 
and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So there's actually the planning and the watering. Of course, it's easy for us to understand that planning means that you're sowing. So someone who sows from the beginning of it. Okay, so what is it to water? Now, from the message of Paul here, it's clear that he's talking about when you sow the seed the first time by sharing it, giving the gospel. Now, when it comes to your giving, maybe in terms of uh, money seeds or other kinds of seeds by way of action, you are the planter. Now, how can you also water it? Which is your question. Okay, if Paul was the one who planted by sowing the seed the first time, by giving out the gospel, and then he said, Apollos was the one who watered. What he meant by that will be clearer to us when we understand what kind of ministry Apollos had. Now, Paul was an apostle. He was also an evangelist. He was a prophet. And plus that, he was a teacher. But primarily here, we can understand he's dealing with his apostolic ministry as a sent one who went out to other places where the gospel had never been and then gave them the gospel from the start. And then Apollos came in and did something. Okay, to understand Apollos' ministry, we'll go to the very beginning of it. In the book of Acts chapter 18, From verse 24 and a certain jew named apollos born at alexandria an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to ephesus this man was instructed in the way of the lord and being fervent in the spirit he spake and taught diligently the things of the lord knowing only the baptism of john at the time he only knew the baptism of john but he was already a minister and here the bible says that he was a teacher he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. He spake and taught diligently. He was primarily a teacher. While Paul was primarily an apostle. So this man, Apollos, was a teacher. Meaning that he taught the word. Okay, if Paul sowed the seeds and Apollos watered as a teacher, it lets us know that watering really has to do with accurate understanding of the word that you speak continually to, upon, and about your seeds. So that's what you do. The accurate words that you speak to your seeds, upon your seeds, and about your seeds will determine how those seeds will perform. So that's the answer to your question. So my question is according to the book of first corinthians 11 27 to 30 when or how does one know that he is unworthy to eat the body and drink the blood of jesus christ as regards taking communion or is there any special thing one has to do to qualify before taking the communion pastor i ask this question because in my former church you had to go through catechism classes and even pass the exams before qualifying to take the communion. And you have to get to a certain age before you even start the class. First of all, the reason they would have given certain classes um, in that church, I don't know the church, but I, I can understand why they would have organized classes and um, expected you to get to a certain age before even beginning the class. They needed to be sure that you had the level of understanding for whatever they were going to teach. And secondly, they wanted you to know what you were involved in. That's why. And that's the reason in certain churches, there are um, classes before you get baptized, uh, classes before you take the communion, not because they're trying to put a limit on you, but because they want to ensure that you really know why you're doing what you're doing. Why are you getting baptized? Why are you taking the, the communion? They want to ensure. And that's the reason for those classes. So, not because of a, a limit. But here's the point. When or how does one know that he is unworthy to eat 
the body and drink the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't talk about being worthy or unworthy. He says, anyone who eats the, the bread or drinks the cup unworthily. The word used is unworthily, not unworthy. There's a big difference between being unworthy and unworthily. Now, being unworthy is what you're thinking the Bible says. And being unworthy means one is not qualified to. And that's not what the Bible says. It says unworthily. It means in a manner that is unbefitting of the communion. So it's dealing with the modus operandi, the way things are carried out, the way it is done. How did you go about eating the communion? Did you do it reverently or irreverently? So he says anyone who does it unworthily in a, in a manner unbecoming of it, you see, in a way that is not right, he says such a person shall be condemned for what he did. He shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. So when you take the communion, do it in a worthy manner. So he's talking about the manner in which you do it. So do it in a worthy manner. Do it reverently. Now you have to read the whole context, read the whole chapter to understand this. You discover that he was referring to how that when they came together in those days, the church, the Corinthian church that he was referring to, um, they didn't wait for one another. Some of them were rushing and they, they mixed up the communion with their love feasts and the Lord was displeased. And he said, look, separate the love feast from the communion. And that was the teaching. He said, separate the love feast from the, from, from the communion. And let them know that if you're taking the communion, you've got to do it in a worthy manner. Now, how do you become worthy to take the communion? That means qualified to take the communion by being born again. Anybody who is born again can take the communion because Jesus gave us the instruction. All of us who are born again, he says, do this in remembrance of me. So what qualifies you is that you have received Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. See, because Jesus this signifies what happened. When you break the bread, it refers to his body that was broken for us. When you drink the cup, it is his blood that was shed for us. So you are testifying that you believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for you. That's what it means. And that's why we do it. That's why Jesus told us to do it. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So you're qualified by being born again. And what the Bible talks about being um, worthy or unworthy uh, is a misconstrued uh, construction of the word. He means unworthily. The one who eats it or drinks unworthily in an unworthy manner is what he means. So don't do it in an unworthy manner. You're qualified if you're born again. amount as seed and we were given a time frame to redeem the pledge so as not to miss out in the blessing what happens if you don't have money at that time to redeem will I miss out in the blessing if I redeem it later thank you pastor God bless you if you redeem it later well you know um, I don't know how the details of this instruction and whether you are representing um, the instructor accurately or not I'm, I, I'm not sure but we should always remember that um, uh, instructions need to be followed accordingly if you if you're going to put your faith on them if for example you're told to do something in two days and you come the fifth day why would you expect uh, expect some result you see, there can be a problem. But I, I'm not sure um, how this was given. But if you're given the time frame, then meet it. If you can't meet it, that's it. And then there are other blessings. That doesn't mean that that's the only blessing that God's going to give. Maybe that was for the time. I don't know where you, where you got that, but instructions are instructions. That's just what they are, and you follow instructions.
So if you were told this is the time within which to do it and you do it afterward, the blessings should not be the same, except there's some grace or some mercy, you see. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. from here but he's asking a question I'd like us to answer he says how come Jesus never
collected offerings, even though he preached so much about, maybe about it you want to say, was he self-sufficient or were there other reasons why he did not? This is very, very interesting. He says, how come Jesus never collected offerings? Who told you? Who told you Jesus never collected offerings? Okay. Maybe I should let somebody speak oh. first. I think Jesus collected offerings because he had a treasurer. He had a treasurer. Yes, he did. And yeah. um, Judas. And this, the treasury was so, was so fat that even when Judas took out of the treasury, um, they didn't know. And the <laughs> and Bible talks about... Jesus had to tell John? Yes, John, Jesus had to tell John mm -hmm. about it. And um, Jesus had certain women who went um, with him. And the Bible says they ministered to him. And there are other times that um, uh, even, even at the last supper, when Jesus told um, Judas. Um, Judas to go out to do something, all disciples thought that he had sent him on an errand to do something that was financial. So yeah. obviously Jesus took... Maybe offense. I should read... There's, a, there's a, a place he just referred to. I want to read it to you. And this is in Luke's Gospel, chapter number 8, beginning with verse 1. He says, And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. Notice, I want you to notice what he says. And the twelve were with him. Talking about the twelve disciples. They were with him. Then you have a command there. Verse 2 says, And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, and then he says, talking about who these women were, he says, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, says, the twelve were with him, and these, these women were with him. And then he says, and many others. Many others. Countless number of people. Who were with him? He says, which ministered unto him of their substance. The twelve were with him. These women that were listed here were with him. And then he says, and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. Think about it. That's offering. <laughs> the ministry was well funded. That's it. That's exactly what he's talking about. See. So anyway, um, you were wrong to have thought that Jesus didn't collect offerings. And Judas Iscariot was the was the was a treasurer. And he wasn't just going somewhere else to find money. No, this was the money that they got from the meetings. From these people, these many who ministered to Jesus of their substance. That's what the Bible says. Pastor, also in the book of Mark, chapter yeah. 12, it talks about how Jesus stood over the treasury and watched as people were coming to give their offerings. Where he was it watching, about and he didn't condemn it, right? Mm -hmm. No, sir. You'll find the keys to wealth creation in one verse, Joshua chapter 1. From verse 8, This book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So, that's where the key is. In other words, you're being pointed to the word of God. That if you will meditate on God's word and do what he tells you to do, you will make your way prosperous and have good success. So that's the key. He shows you that the word of God, living according to God's word, is the key. So you meditate on the word. Now, as you study the word of God, you will discover several things. See, at different points of your life, the word of God will enlighten you on the various things you should do. Different acts of faith. And how to walk in him. All of this will be made known to you as you study the word. So he's just told you that meditating on God's word is the key to success in life. And that includes world creation.
for this opportunity. Please teach me, is it right to make a pledge for an offering? Yes, you can make a pledge for an offering, so long as you pay it, you redeem it. Of our time, preach more about prosperity than the end times or revelation. Well, I believe um, most churches preach what you just talked about, the end times or revelation, and many other subjects. There are not so many that actually preach prosperity. They only are loudest. The loudest because when you prosper, you can say what you want to say loud enough. See, um, prosperous preachers have the capacity to make the gospel known much more than those who may not be prospering. So um, that's the reason. If you, if you have money, you can, you can amplify whatever you want to say because money is an amplifier. So that's, that's what is really happening. But secondly, uh, the concerns of most people around the world center around financial problems. See, most people are concerned about their money. A lot of people work. Why do you think they work? Because they love the land or love their nation or love the people around them? No, they work because they want money. They're concerned about money. They're concerned about the financial system in the world. And because of that concern, it is necessary that we also minister the word of God to them and help them understand God's perspective about their finances or on their finances. So that's the reason, not because they have lost their direction and, and have gone preaching prosperity. Prosperity is a part of God's message. In fact, uh, in the third epistle of St. John, let me read that to you so you understand why, how important it is. The third epistle of St. John, You'd be amazed. Verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Beloved, I wish above all things, above all things. Did you hear that? It says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and me in health, even as I so prosper. I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. That means his soul was prospering, meaning spiritual prosperity was already there. And then he says, I want you to be in health, meaning physical prosperity was already there. Then he says, I want you to prosper. Definitely he was referring to financial and material prosperity. So he says, I want you to prosper financially and materially as you already prosper spiritually. I want you to prosper financially, materially, and be in health. That means physical prosperity as your spirit is already prospering. So if you're a child of God and walking in the word of God, you definitely will be prospering spiritually. But then he says, I want you above all things to prosper financially and materially. So there's no big surprise that God will uh, move his ministers to preach along those lines. To teach brethren how to prosper financially. But I would like to know if it is proper for a pastor to confront people if the money is small in the meetings. E.g. to be asked, why is the offering so small? Or to ask the brethren one after the other, uh, how much did you pay? Well, um, one of the things I'd like to say to you about this, when you question certain things that uh, some pastors do, you need to be very careful about your perception. For example, if this didn't happen directly to you, then you should be careful because you don't know how God might have led that pastor in dealing with such situations. If it happened to you and you weren't happy about what happened, then that's between you, that pastor, and God. See, just remember, if you study the Old Testament, you'll find there were things that God asked his, his ministers to do that were either ridiculous, out of the ordinary, or even questionable and yet they got the results the result is what is necessary see because so far at least you haven't said he did something that was con completely contrary to the word of god this isn't contrary to the word of god see because you he, just as you can't find the scripture to support what he did you can't find the one that's against what he did so um always be careful about 
criticizing what a pastor might have done on a certain occasion, which he may do or might have done under the anointing. See, so if it didn't happen to you, then be careful about it. But if it happened to you, go back to the pastor and say, Pastor, can you just explain to me why it went this way? And he might let you know why he did what he did. partner with the ministry because I love God. What do I do to have that much seed? Well, to have that much seed, you start with what you have. And you know, when you give to God, you receive an abundance in your harvest. Then you have a greater capacity to give next time. And then you do it again and you keep doing it. The more you give, the greater your capacity to give. And so you always get blessed when you give. You always have a harvest on your giving which means a multiplied harvest. God always multiplies your seed back to you. And in that way, you keep having an increasing capacity to do more. That's the way you do it. So you can actually give your way to the top. I've done it often in the past, but I repented. How can I get rid of the guilt that remains? Should I pay back what I owe? One of two things or both. First, accept God's forgiveness. Because for every sin, and includes this one, if you would accept God's forgiveness, it will work for you. It will cleanse your conscience. The second thing is, maybe you should pay back. It depends on what you owe. If you can pay back, pay back. If you can't pay back because you don't have it, there's really nothing you can do if you don't have it. If you don't have it, you don't have it. And God will also forgive you. But if you can pay back, go and pay back. Paying back will also serve to cleanse or purge your conscience. So once you have um, settled this in your heart that this God doesn't want you to spend your time but to give it to Him, start acting accordingly. That's what you're supposed to do. Malachi 3 tend to kick in when you have been obedient and paying your tithes. Okay, let's read Malachi 3 10 that Keller wants to kick in. You want to know when, how long it takes for it to kick in. So the book of Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 10. The Bible says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that they may be meet, meet in my house and prove me now here with the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And so you want to see all of these blessings come to you. Yes. Now, um, the important thing is whether or not you know when these blessings begin to come. You got to realize that when you are giving your tithes, look at what the Bible says. It says, prove me now here which said the Lord, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. When he pours you out a blessing, notice he didn't say, if I will not pour you out money. He didn't say, if I will not pour you out harvest. He said, I pour you out a blessing. Now, the blessing of God on your tithing can come in several different ways. Sometimes, we're not, we're not careful enough to recognize even when God's blessing us. No wonder that old songwriter said, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Sometimes, this blessing is poured out to us in ideas. You know, an idea can spark up a, a tremendous harvest of blessings in your life. An idea. Were you listening for an idea? Did you know when God sent an idea to you? 
Were you listening when God was talking to you? Or did you miss the idea that God brought to you? You know, we give our tithes, we give our offerings, and then we're not listening to God. He says, I'll pour you out a blessing. See? A blessing. He says, then there'll not be room enough to receive it. In a seed is a forest. Every seed has the potential of a forest. Did you realize that? When God answers you and blesses you with that seed, do you realize what's in there? The seed of a blessing can come to you in a simple idea. Welcome God's idea. And it's one of the reasons you go to church. It's one of the reasons you listen to the teachings of God's word. Because every time when you have sown your seed, when you have given, the next thing you ought to do, make sure you go to church. Make sure you attend the services. Because as you're hearing God's word, the Lord is ministering to you. And as it ministers to you, a vision can come to you. An idea can come to you. Sometimes, you know, a thought. It just comes a simple thought. You, you don't even realize that that's an idea packaged. That's a vision packaged. It seems like it's a simple thought. And a lot of times, inspired thoughts come to us from God. And it's God talking to us. It's the Holy Spirit talking to us in our thoughts. In the response that we give to the Word of God, the Lord is ministering to us. So, study the Bible. Study the absolute realities that we give to you. Listen to God's Word like this. You'll be amazed at what you'll come up with. You'll be amazed at the changes that will take place in your life. There are those who say, well, I've been giving and I've been tithing, but I haven't seen the result. The reason you're not seeing the result is because you're not listening. If you're listening, you will see the results. The result is in the messages that we share with you every week. Have you been listening to that? Have you been acting upon them? The result is in the, the articles and rhapsody of realities that you're listening to or, or studying every day. God's voice is coming to you every day. If you listen, he'll guide you. He opened doors for you that you never knew existed before. So be smart to listen. Various ministry arms and you make pledges and are unable to redeem them due to unavailability of funds. Would God take an action against you? Since he said in the book of Ecclesiastes that we must fulfill our vows. Well, since he said it's on availability of funds as a cause, he will not take actions against you. What you have to do is to learn how to make those funds available. Because you are acting your faith to make those pledges. But you've got to learn how to walk by faith to make the necessary finance available. So that's what you've got to study. So go back and listen to the word that you've been taught. Get the tapes, get the books, get the materials. L listen to the word again and be strengthened in your faith. And you'll be able to do this. But God's not going to take actions against you since you didn't have it anyway because he's not going to ask you to steal something. So you, you didn't break your vow. You, didn't, you just didn't get it. See, so that's the way he'll look at it. There's a, an amount of childishness to it, you see, because you don't make um, uh, pledges except you, you have a faith to fulfill. The financial global crisis in the world, does it really or can it affect the believer or the one who's born again? Because a lot of Christians are complaining about the financial crisis. Well, um, does, can it affect the believer? Yes, it can affect the believer because we live in the world. See, we are not of the world, though we live in the world. So the things that happen around us can affect us. But then, that's why we need to be in the Word of God. That's why we need to function by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to function through higher principles of life. Otherwise, the things happening around us can affect us. So, in Job chapter 22, 
in verse 29 it says when men are cast down then thou shalt say there is lifting up and he shall save the humble person he shall deliver the island of the innocent and it is delivered by the pureness of thine hands so when men are cast down thou shalt say there's lifting up he tells you what you're going to say so we can be affected by happenings around us but that's why we need the word of god so we can function because we are in the world but not of the world jesus was hungry he was affected by hunger and when there was no food he couldn't get anything but then he could operate through the word of god see so you use god's word that's why you've got to learn the word of god and become a man or woman of faith We had four options from the several questions you sent to us. Number one, can one who does miracles in the name of Jesus be unknown to God? Number two, the use of candles and prayers. Number three, the ordinance of feet washing. And you didn't choose any of these. You chose the last one here, which is, which is should a Christian borrow money? The Bible says those who belong to God would lend to many and borrow from none. Does this mean that it is wrong for a Christian to borrow money? Borrowing has several different details to it. And um, if we're looking at the credit system of the world, then that's not a problem. Because that credit system of the world really is a business. I want you to understand it's a business it's a it's a transaction it's a business transaction now the kind of borrowing that the bible talks about where it says you shall uh, lend and not borrow is looking at borrowing out of uh penury out of luck out of um poverty but you see the credit system of the world where you use your credit cards and uh, run such a system is not for someone who doesn't have it's actually a system of convenience now it goes bad because of abuse it goes bad because of abuse and that's why a lot of times people many are advised against it there's nothing wrong with the system it's the it's the abuse that's the problem because such transactions are based on expectations from both sides so is um, uh, they are based on speculations one is taken uh, 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 a credit because he thinks by such and such a date he will have that much money and be able to pay back so they advance your credit on the basis of your genuine expectations now if you don't have job a, a job you don't have any means of income they will not advance you any credit so it's based on the expectation that you have genuine expectation and we know that sometimes these things just don't work out the man loses his job for example and so the income he was expecting doesn't show up and so he can't pay his debts and the creditor was also gambling on the fact that your job will be secure over a period of time and so now you lost that job and he can't get his money and that's why Oftentimes, they insist on a collateral. With that collateral, if there's any problem, they can hold on to that. So, if you're borrowing money, borrow with the right thought, the right idea of borrowing money on genuine income. What you actually have. What you know you actually have. So you actually use that credit system as a matter of convenience so you can commit your funds to something else, to some other um, worthy activities without putting so much into it. 
while you can pay gradually your creditors so it's actually a matter of convenience but anything beyond that where you're borrowing out of want out of luck you you get into trouble because now you can't pay back how are you gonna pay there's no there's no real expectation and in the first place if they do their job well the creditor will not lend you money he shouldn't lend you money so the abuse of the system is really where the problem is so that's that wasn't what God was talking about when he said he shall lend and not borrow because he wasn't dealing with the system of convenience there he was dealing with those who don't have and they don't have anywhere to get money and so they have to beg you for something and say well if I the borrowing capital the borrowing all of these things yeah I want to I need you to give me this and then when I use it I expect to get something out of it and then I can pay you back you see they're borrowing out of their luck not a system of convenience but out of real luck out of poverty penury and so and God wants to take you out of that level so you shouldn't belong there but you can enjoy the convenience of the credit system without abusing it and it'll work for you so that's actually what it's all about not borrowing money or whatever else you borrow He says, Sir, I want clarity on the practice of redeeming the firstborn, first sons, and properties. How relevant is the practice now in the New Testament? I really need an answer to this question. I look forward to hearing from you soonest. Thank you. The practice of redeeming the firstborn for sons and properties. How relevant is the practice now in the New Testament? You know, if you study several portions of the Bible in the Old Testament, you would find several areas where uh, the Lord said to the children of Israel to give to him. He actually said that the firstborn of man and beast belonged to him. And then he said, um, but for the firstborn of man and for every unclean uh, animal you should redeem he said to the children of Israel you have to redeem them in other words you will bring something in their place later on he explained to them how to redeem them with a certain amount now this was all in the law but you see the teaching of first fruit or uh, the firstling of an animal was based on God's plan to bless rather than to take. See, it was his plan to bless and not to take. He wasn't trying to claim something for himself. For example, in bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, God said to Moses, he said, you go tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn. He said, you've taken my firstborn. You've kept my firstborn. And if you don't let Israel go, I'm going to have your firstborn. And so Moses went to Pharaoh and told him. And then you remember, after the ten plagues, he said the last one was the death of the firstborn of every house of Egypt. Beginning from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of his servants and every house of Egypt mourned because God said you kept my firstborn now looking at that you remember that was definitely before the law and God said Israel is my firstborn so when he was giving the law this time to the children of Israel it had to be a sacrifice he said when they brought the firstling they had to offer the sacrifice they brought it to the priest and offered that sacrifice but prior to the law it was a faith consecration and that's why he said Israel is my firstborn 
But you remember, how did Israel become his firstborn? Israel was Jacob, don't forget. And um, Esau had sold his birthright to Jacob. Both of them were sons of Isaac, the son of Abraham. So uh, after Esau sold his birthright to Jacob, whose name was turned or changed to Israel by God, he was now God's firstborn. And so it was his descendants that were in Egypt when God said to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn. Now, that firstborn didn't have to be redeemed because he was committed in trust to God. Remember, his father committed the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant to him. And he became the custodian of that Abrahamic covenant. In today's um, uh, dispensation, it's the same thing. As it was then an act of faith, so it is now. It became a law, but now that the law has been repealed, we don't have to keep it according to the law, but according to faith. In the same way that we keep the, the instructions of tithing according to faith and not according to law, because tithing came before the law. The first fruit came before the law. So we keep the tithing, the offerings, the first fruits, all according to faith before the law. Because the Bible says that if we are Abraham's children, then we are children of faith. It says all those who are the children of faith are the children of Abraham, who is the father of faith and therefore the father of us all. So we act according to his faith. So you're not really needing anymore to redeem the firstborn. Because to redeem the firstborn was to take him back and offer a sacrifice in his place. You don't have to redeem them. You commit them to the Lord. That's what he expects of you now. Because he doesn't accept those human sacrifices. Those sacrifices don't have to be offered anymore. Whether of animals or of, um, of crop. He doesn't need that anymore. Because the one perfect sacrifice has been offered and that's Jesus so now you give your firstborn to God just like the the uh, the fathers of faith did before the law and you might as well give your first your second and how many uh, uh, how many children you may have all of them you should give to the Lord today all right but um, as always there's a, a special blessing when we give our first fruit to God. And, you know, in terms of our finances, or all the blessings that God brings to us, and children. See, so you do that without redeeming them. You don't need to redeem them, because they're not killed, they're committed to God. question is not very clear. I'd like you to um, explain further exactly what you want to know. Because to ask, is borrowing money a work of evil? I really want to be sure um, your question is clear enough. So we'll begin answering. So I'd like you to write again and let me know exactly what you want to know. If you say, is borrowing money wrong? I can explain. Um, but if you say is borrowing money a work of evil like you've asked it's difficult to be sure what you really want to know do you mean is it of the devil do you mean um, is it engineered by Satan is it, you know what do you really want to know so let me know told me that we the members can only be rich through him in other words he's the only one that can bless us with riches Pastor, please, I'm confused. <laughs> uh, I assume you probably misunderstood what the pastor said. I'm thinking that the pastor might have been wanting to emphasize the importance of pastoral blessings, but not to say that um, it is only the pastor uh, that could make you rich. From what I just said in the previous question, you are already made rich by God, because you're his child. The Bible says, well, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. 
So whatever Christ has, we have. We're joint heirs with him. We're already rich by that, simply. So no one really needs, needs to make us rich. We're already rich. That's what it's all about. Pastor, do unbelievers have demons assigned to them? Just as believers have angels assigned to minister to them? Can a demon also be assigned to a Christian by the devil, though he has no power over the Christian? Well, it's possible because they have their own structure. I mean, the devils, the demons have to report to Satan on their activities as well. They, may, they are organized, as the Bible shows us, talks about um, the different orders of uh, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and so on. So we do know that they have a spiritual structure. But um, whether every Christian therefore has a demon assigned to him really makes no difference to what we are and what we can do. Because remember, Satan is not a factor, nor are his demons a factor. So if they're not a factor, it doesn't matter whether or not they are assigned to believers. They're just not a factor. They might as well not be there. So if you know the word of God, you really don't care whether or not Satan himself is assigned to you. Tied separately or together as one, both. God does bless you separately and he also blesses you as, as a family. So you can give together and you can give separately. Both are correct. You do both of them. I want to know if children are supposed to pay tithe. Remember, tithing is based on your income. Income as per increase. It says you should give your tithes according to your increase. And that's a, a, the, the, the tenth of your increase. That's 10% of your increase. Now, um, a child can receive, a, a child can be blessed. And many times parents receive on behalf of the children. And if you will receive on behalf of the children, you better pay the tithes on behalf of the children as well. So if the children can be blessed, they can give their tithes because tithing is based on what the Lord has blessed you with. The increase on your finances, your material blessings. So you give your tithes. So do the same on behalf of the children. And actually, that's the right way for them to begin to learn what tithing is about. So no one is too young to tithe. If you're not too young to receive from God, you're not too young to tithe. To engage in forex trading, well, that's a business. Um, as long as you're not cheating anybody and you're going by the rules, nothing wrong with that secondly how do you live with someone who is hot-tempered and violent sometimes whenever there's an argument she's always placing curses and sometimes they happen exactly the way it's mentioned I'm scared and worried what can I do thanks and God bless well you shouldn't be afraid of anybody who places curses on others you shouldn't be afraid because in the first place God doesn't want us cursing people and if you're a Christian, never be afraid of somebody cursing you because the Bible says you're called to inherit a blessing, which means your inheritance in life is a blessing. And so anybody placing a curse on you is placing uh, a curse that will go off curse. See, so you never have to be afraid. Don't live in fear. Just because some of the things, some of the curses that person placed on others came to pass doesn't mean that you must be subject to the same fears never be afraid all the time in the word of God we're told fear not fear not fear not so don't live in fear I'm telling you that because you said I'm scared and worried the very things that you should not do because if you are afraid if you are scared and you are worried you are giving Satan the necessary materials 
to haunt you and to dominate you. Refuse to be afraid. Refuse to be afraid. The Bible says there's no enchantment against Jacob. That means no curse can affect the Christian. You're a child of God. No curse can affect you. It says we should ask and will be given. I want to know, Pastor, after how long do we receive what we have asked from God? After how long do we receive? Now, you said the Bible says we should ask and be given. But can we read? exactly what Jesus said. Remember, there are different kinds of prayers, the different rules for asking God and receiving. So I want us to read from St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. This has to do with the prayer of faith and what Jesus taught. I want to read from verse 22. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Then in the 24th verse, it says, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. He says, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. When ye pray, when do you believe? When you pray. When you receive, when you pray, he says, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Remember, God is a spirit. You are a spirit. When you ask God for something, he gives it to you in the spirit. Now, once your spirit can apprehend it, you have it. Now, you may be talking about the, the time between where you ask, when you ask and when you lay your physical hands on that particular thing you've asked for. It depends on the quality of your faith and your communication of faith that is to say if your faith is strong you will apprehend it with your spirit and actually live in the reality of it and then your confessions will create realities so that's what really matters can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now.